I mean, Naresh, if there's someone who needs to be thanked, you know, that, that is you for actually, you know, pulling off this event and, you know, being able to get so many people. Now, a little story between you and me, he said, oh, you know, I was surprised that I was starting after which, you know, Naresh would have come on and had the introductory talks, uh, or, or, well, the introduction. And, you know, Naresh comes in and tells me, oh, well, you know, people in India never come on time, he goes. <laughs> and so, at least if we put you first, and then I introduce everyone, we'll, we'll know people will show up. But I think he miscalculated the fact that I'm Italian, and <laughs> we, our, our, our view of punctuality is a bit uh, <laughs> skewed. But, yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm Francesco Cesarini. Um, I usually say I've been dabbling with Erlang since uh, 1994. That's when I first used it. But I've been using it full time since uh, 1996. And uh, I, I started using it as an, well, full time as an intern at the computer science laboratory with um, you know, Robert Birding, Joe Armstrong, and Mike Williams. And when discussing, you know, considering you know, this is the first time we've had uh, such an event in India, you know, trying to get together not only Erlangers, but also you know, elixirists uh, or alchemists, and those, uh, and also a group uh, who want to learn more about the different technologies. We thought, you know, kind of an introductory talk would be the ideal way, you know, to, to open up and, you know, and, um, you know, to open up the day. So this is, you know, going to be fairly high level. And what I'm going to do is you know, just give an introduction uh, to Erlang from you know, my own personal perspective, uh, from my days you know, when I was at the computer science laboratory and uh, you know, working with Mike, Joe, and Robert. So Robert is actually here, but I think he was in the customs queue uh, or immigration queue at 4 in the morning <laughs> today. I, that's when I last yeah, re had a sign of life from him. So he'll be showing up a little bit earlier. And, and I have to say, it's a very good idea not to put Robert first because he's worse than me. So if, if I'm the next to last person to get on the plane you know, before you know, it's about to depart, Robert is the person they're actually calling at the gate. So you know, putting him last was very, very wise. So, um, I, so I, what's happened? Okay. Uh, okay, so, so, you know, uh, the best way, you know, to introduce Erlang, and I did this, change this a little bit when, you know, I was having dinner last night, and someone said that no one, you know, Erlang in India was there, and people were using it, but it was actually only WhatsApp, which, you know, brought it, brought it you know, to, to everyone's attention. And indeed, you know, if you go back at the WhatsApp acquisition, uh, it, it got acquired by Facebook for, an obscene amount of money for, uh, for $19 billion plus the tie-in. And at the time of the acquisition, it had you know, 450 million active users. Um, and they were adding at the time a million users per day. Now, you know, they, they, they're past, you know, they're in the billions right now. But at the time of when they were acquired, there were 450 million active users. They were sending uh, December 31st, 2013. So was the, the, the record, you know, when, when they were acquired. And that particular day, they sent 54 billion messages. They sent on average about three, four, mess three, four more times messages, three, four times the amount of messages than the total number of SMSs every day. And yeah, they've been very secretive over the, 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 the size of their server park. I know that in the summer of 2013, so uh, the year before they, they had acquired, they were running all of their services on 200 servers. So 200 servers, you know, doubling, you know, sending at the time probably twice as many messages in the total number of SMSs. And not only, but 70% you know, of their users, of their user base was active on a daily basis. It's not that they've downloaded the app and then forgot about it. And what really astounded a lot of people was not just the fact that, you know, uh, was the fact that, you know, at least in the media and on papers, they had, they, they, they basically claimed that they had 32 engineers at the time of the acquisition. And that was, yeah, that's the truth. There were 32 engineers, but no one actually, the media never out, went out and reported that in the back end team. 
So the team which actually did all of the server side programming, the did all of the support, the maintenance, uh, the total number of engineers was actually 10. And uh, you know, the, the splurged out after the acquisition and expanded that team to 13 people. Once again, 13 seems to be a number which keeps on recurring, at least here in the airline world for those, yeah. But um, uh, so for, they went up to 13 people. So you had 13 people doing the development of the system. They were on call 24 seven for support and they did the maintenance of all the code which existed as well. Uh, can you just imagine that number? And at least for us who'd been working with Airline, this, you know, this was not a surprise. Uh, we, we, we knew that your, your level of productivity, in, and the level of productivity in general if you're using functional programming increases massively. We also knew that you know, for you know, the right type of applications, running on the beam is, you know, th th there's no comparison. It's, it's, it's a VM which is highly optimized for massive concurrency uh, and soft real time. So, so you know, for us, you know, the match was perfect. And you know, we at Erling Solutions, we were working with WhatsApp even before they had an office. So we've kind of followed this whole journey. But you know, the fact is you know, there were many, many other companies who you know, at the time were using Erlang as, as its secret source. And, um, you know, and these are just, just some of them uh, out there. You know, they were you know, everything from startups all the way to you know, Fortune 100 companies and you know, Salesforce, IBM, and others. And you know, why, you know, what, 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 <coughs> what brings these companies you know, together? You know, if you go back to you know, the mid 80s, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole telecom market just picture, you know, go back and, and picture India back in the mid 80s. Picture the phone system here in the mid 80s. You know, it was the same in Italy or anywhere in Europe. Uh, you had, there, there were two things which were happening at the time. The first is that there were monopolies. You know, uh, you were in the, you know, in the UK, you, know, you, you had to go to British Telecom. You weren't happy with the service which British Telecom provided? So, doesn't matter, it's your problem, <laughs> not theirs. The same in Italy, you had to deal with SIP, which you know, was everyone's terror. It took months to get a phone line. So, and, but you know, what was happening in the mid 80s was that, was that the whole telecom market was in a state of transition. So first of all, all of these monopolies were being broken down. The same was happening in America with Bell, which was considered to be too large and it was broken down into all of the baby Bells, which then ended up re-emerging again, but you know, that, that, that's, that, that's a story for another day. Um, and so, so that was the first thing which was happening. There was the deregulation of the telecom markets. And that meant that you know, when you started phoning your phone companies now, not only did they say good morning, um, <coughs> you know, they were actually polite to you because they knew that if, you pissed, you know, if they pissed you off, you'd go off and you know, you, you'd change providers or you would soon have the chance to do that. The second thing which was happening was uh, that you know, all of these vertical networks, all of these uh, vertical Network. So, you know, cellular, you know, telephony, data IP, you know, cable TV, were all converging and going over to a packet-based, uh, you know, to a packet-based solutions. So, you know, they'd all have, you know, access networks, you know, all powered by common backbone. So this is, what, you know, this is the direction which, in which, you know, they believed everything was going to start heading towards. And, you know, Ericsson at the time had, you know, become number one when it came to telecom infrastructure. Uh, and they'd done that thanks to the AXC 10 switch, which was one of the first digital switches in the world, which, you know, this did, which they started shipping out. And, you know, they started shipping it out in, you know, the mid 80s. And, you know, the, the, the question they were asking themselves is, with this change in telecom market, how can we remain competitive? How can we actually go in and, you know, what technologies should we use to develop the next generation of uh, telecom systems? Th that was the question, you know, uh, the computer science laboratory, which has just been founded, w was, out, was set out to answer. You know, how do we actually program? How do we, you know, create the next generation of telecom switches? And uh, if you think of it, you know, telecom switches are incredibly complex. You've got protocol stacks, which, yeah, which are not for the faint of heart. You pick up the phone, you expect to hear a 2-2 on the other end. 
I don't know here in India, but you know, back in Sweden, if you picked up the phone and you did not hear the two two on the other end, and it's happened, it's happened to me maybe once or twice, you could be sure that it would make the front pages of the newspapers the following day because you had laws which required the phone systems to be up full stop. So if you didn't hear that too, too, the phone company was breaking the law. And the second thing which kicked in was that the penalties Ericsson had to pay uh, or any uh, telecom infrastructure provider had to pay if there was an outage which was the provider's fault, they had, um, which was the provider's fault. The fines were massive. They had massive fines, massive penalties which had to be paid. So that meant that Ericsson made sure that the code they shipped would not break, that it had no single points of failure, and you know, it had many levels of resiliency built in. The second thing about phone networks, you know, back in the 80s was it was the only truly scalable system out there. And by scalable system, you know, the WhatsApp record, you know, prior to the acquisition was the 31st of December. Um, you know, 2013, that, yeah, and that's when everyone, you know, 31st of December, everyone goes in and calls each other and wishes each other Happy New Year. And so by scalable, you know, I mean two things. A, it needed to handle a large volume of data, but it also needed to handle massive spikes when everyone would pick up the phone at the same time and wish each other Happy New Year. Um, and it had to be maintainable. One of the big issues they were having with uh, the AXC 10 switches was the cost of maintenance. It took six months just to train a support engineer to become productive, six months. And so you know, the cost of maintenance, so they became number one in the world, uh, you know, thanks to them, but the cost of maintaining them was, was, really, it was really, really high. And last thing, you know, it was a distributed system. Telecom systems were, at the time, by nature distributed. And you know, these are all hard problems to solve especially if they go head to head with you know, time to market. How do you go in and, you know, b back when there was a monopoly, it was fine. You know, you could just picture, you know, um, Ericsson CEO going in and, you know, playing golf with the minister of the post and telecoms. Uh, and yeah, at the end of their golf round, you know, they'd sign the contract. And then Ericsson had all the time in the world to deliver whatever system it was delivering. So it could have been a broadband system. You know, and often these projects took a decade. You know, to give you an idea, I was working on um, Ericsson's your broadband solution, so their ADS cell solution, you know, back in 1997. You know, uh, they didn't start rolling out ADS cell until 2000, 2001. So, and, that, yeah, and that was the first kind of wave you know, w which started going out. So the lead time was massive. And, and the problem now is that you know, you had the deregulation, you had competition. If, uh, you know, the, post, the, the PTT, you know, could not buy a product from you, they couldn't afford to wait 10 years anymore because all of a sudden, you know, customers would jump ship to the telco provider who could provide that service. And so, you know, competition, you know, time to market also, uh, all of a sudden became critical. And, you know, the computer science laboratory started scratching their heads, asking themselves, okay, how do we address all of these issues? And, and what they did, so Joe, Mike, Robert, under the direction of Robert Birding, the, the team was actually much, much larger, but I think the, the people who did most of the work and you know, stayed on the longer, so Joe, Mike, and Robert, and Bjarne, they set about prototyping, you know, finite state machines, prototyping telecom applications. And they did that for two to three years using all of the existing languages, you know, which were being used in the industry and academia at the time. So um, they went in and, uh, you know, they went in and, you know, looked at concurrent languages. So small talk, ADA, modular, chill. They looked at functional programming languages. At the time it was ML and Miranda, which, which prevailed. And they looked at logical languages like Prolog. And after about two to three years of prototyping telecom switches, uh, how many of you have seen Erlang the movie? Okay, for those of you who haven't, um, uh, when no one else is watching, uh, go on YouTube and, and, and search Erlang the movie and you will find um, a video which was made by the computer science laboratory in the early 90s trying to promote Erlang. And there you'll actually see a, a switch 
switch, you know, which uh, they were programming in Erlang. They were using a similar switch, you know, to, to program and prototype in all of these languages. And, you know, trying to figure out what programming language to use, after about three, two to three years of doing these prototypes, they came to the conclusion that there was no, you know, there were a lot of great features in these languages, but there was no one feature which um, encompassed them all, which had, which, which, yeah. There was no one language which had all of these features they were looking for. And notice there's a language missing up here, and it's Lisp. You know, they were going to evaluate Lisp. They had ordered a Lisp machine, and this Lisp machine was two weeks late. So at that point in time, you know, uh, the Swedish uh, models of Brandy, the Swedish way of working is uh, a lot of the brainstorming gets done around your coffee breaks. And it's almost, the coffee breaks almost become a continuation of work. You sit around and you discuss ideas, you brainstorm. And so, you know, during one of the numerous coffee breaks they were having, uh, waiting for this list machine to be delivered, they, Joe Armstrong came up with the idea, why don't we invent our own language? And, you know, there's no one language which has all of these features. Let, let them, let's put them all together and invent our own. And that's where they went in, and um, that's where they, went, where, where they went in. And, you know, they all off, ran off to the rooms, all excited, and they started writing the specifications. And, and, you know, when this list machine finally arrived, it got, just left in its box. Uh, everyone's so excited about inventing Erlang, no one touched that Lisp machine. And you know, as a side story, um, the person who'd sold it, you kept on you know, phoning Joe Armstrong, asking him, oh, you know, how's the Lisp machine? Oh, oh, it's great, it's great, it's great. You know, and it was still in the box. Uh, and that kept on going until about six months later, when you know, the salesperson calls Joe, oh, Joe, yeah, someone just down the hall from you want, wants to you know, try out the Lisp machine. Can we just drop by your office to see it? And at that point, they actually took it out of the box and, you know, and set it up and, and uh, started playing with it. But um, what, what, what they started doing was they started spending uh, probably, yeah, they ended up spending about, I'd say, another two to three years prototyping. Uh, and you know, prototyping, uh, an Erlang VM, which was at the time written in Prolog. So they were using Prolog not for speed of develop, well, not for speed of execution, it was incredibly slow, but for speed of development. It allowed them to quickly do changes uh, and upgrade everything. And I think, you know, the fact that you know, the first VM was written in Prolog, um, you know, explains a bit of how, it explains a bit of the syntax, which is kind of filtered through in, in Erlang. And they, they used the prolog. Yeah, they, they, they used prolog, and you know, you had Joe, who, you know, was, I'd say, he was the inventor. He was the innovator. He was the one thinking up all of these ideas. You had Robert, who likes, who's an aesthetician. He likes things to be nice. And then you had Mike William, who's who was pragmatic, and he had the industry experience. And you know, you ask Mike what he contributed, you know, to to Airline. And he very modestly says, well, I spent most of my time trying to convince Joe and Robert not to include this feature in the language uh, because it was cool. But yeah, it might have been cool, but it was useless. It didn't help at all. And so, you know, Mike was there trying, you know, moderating, trying to convince everyone to keep Erlang as simple as possible. And indeed, you know, that was the result, an incredibly simple language, which was, you know, ideal for, you know, building scalable, fault-tolerant, distributed, soft real time systems, massively concurrent soft real time systems. You know, back in the 90s, it was only telecoms which had that problem. Along comes the internet, that, you know, that domain expands on, expanded onto, you know, web development, it expands onto banking, it expands onto online trading, online gambling, uh, online gaming. All of these IoT, all of these companies and verticals online now, have exactly the same problem which Ericsson and the telco space solved a long time ago. So, you know, I think the point here is, you know, they did not set out a, to invent a language and then try to figure out what to do with it. They set out to solve a problem, and the solution happened to be a programming language. And I recommend, you know, you go to Robert's talk this evening, and I think he will, you know, walk you through kind of the journey you know, they went through uh, when, when they did invent Erlang in, in, in much more detail. So, um, 
you know, it, it, it's, it, so that's very different. So, you know, they actually created something to solve a particular problem. And, you know, and we see today, you know, how this is kind of expanding into, you know, Elixir as well, Lisp flavored Erlang. So there are a lot of languages, you know, what they really got right were the semantics and the simplicity. It's an incredible simple language uh, which allow, which makes it really maintainable. And, you know, this, it's running on a virtual machine which is highly optimized for concurrency and soft real time. You know, they're, they're very, very conservative and strict as to what gets added because they don't want to break the soft real time properties. And, you know, adding Ruby to the mix, you know, we ended up getting Elixir as well. And so now, you know, it's kind of evolving. Uh, you know, it's great to see uh, it's great to see and, you know, and, and find out that you know, a lot of the ideas you know, which we've been working on now were right and that they're now entering and filtering into other programming languages. So what makes so Erlang so special? You know, it usually, you know, we've always claimed that it was four to ten times less code than conventional languages such as C++, Java, uh, C, and others. And it used to be an urban legend. You know, there, were, there was one study which was done at Ericsson uh, which uh, where you know they, they re-implemented some parts of a phone switch, an office switch, the MD110, uh, to Erlang, and they came to the conclusion that Erlang was about ten times less code than Plex, which had you know that, that which had been used to implement the switch, and it's the actual switch which uh, you know they talk about in Erlang the movie, online, and so it was you know ten times less code, but you know they were really worried and said no one's going to believe us. So in the official report, they, they said that, oh, uh, we re-implemented the switch in Erlang, and we got four times less code. And why, you know, you, you ask them, why did you pick four times? Oh, we just made it up, but we thought it was big enough to be impressive, but small enough not to you know, cause any doubts. So we told people it was 10 times less code, no one would have believed us. So, you know, they, they were ready then back then, you're trying to play the management game, um, you know, not, not so successfully. So that was the official stance. But, you know, there, there have been studies which were made um, in academia, so by Harriet Watt University, which took a, a, a messaging app written in C++, they re-implemented it in Erlang, and the C++ application was not written by Ericsson. It was written by Motorola. And actually, when I first heard of the study, um, the study went, oh, you know, um, come and discover, you know, uh, you know, looking at the usability of functional programming in the telco space. And you know, I started banging my head against the table, wondering, okay, academia does some great things, but at times, you know, they really waste their time. Why have a study to see uh, the suitability of functional languages in the telco space? All they need to go is speak to Ericsson, and, you know, who've been using it at the time. You know, they'd been using it for well over a decade. No, no, for 20 years at the time. It was 2002 they started the study until I realized that it was actually Motorola funding the project. And you know, Motorola, which was one of the biggest Ericsson competitors at the time, obviously wouldn't go to Ericsson and ask them. So they picked you know, a code base from Motorola in C++, rewrote it in Erlang, and you know, the, 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 they concluded, you know, they went in and looked at every single line of code and concluded that you know, depending on how you count, the Erlang code was four to 20 times less code than its counterpart in C++. And you know, there are lots of papers out there which you, know, which you can Google on, on this comparison. But I'll, referring to this, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be referring to this uh, a little bit later. So if, if we look at it, it's, um, you know, it, it's declarative. What that means is that it's got, a very, um, it, it's got a very high level of abstraction. And by using constructs such as pattern matching, uh, you know, coming, which, you know, which come from functional programming, uh, you're able to write short, uh, concise programs. And here's just a little example for those who, who, who have not coded in Erlang, uh, where we calculate factorial. And what we do is, you know, assume we go in and call factorial of six, we try to pattern match in the first clause, but six does not match to zero, so the pattern matching fails, we go on to the next clause. And we call factorial of six when six is greater than or equal to one. And that guard match is true, so we call six times factorial of five. And we continue recursing until we hit the base case zero, until you know, n you know, is decreased to zero, at which point we turn, return one. And this gives us one times two times three times four times five times six. And n here are variables. 
and it, 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 the variables are noted with uppercase letters. And it's worth saying that variables in Erlang are single assignment. Once you've bound them, you cannot change them. And this immutability you know, really simplifies the implementation, not only of the garbage collector, but also you know, of your programs. It forces programmers to think in a functional way. It forces programmers to, you know, to write short, compact, concise code. And actually, well, reduces the amount of bugs yeah, you, you'll see. Another thing to worth noticing here is <coughs> the lack of defensive programming. If we call factorial with a negative number, it won't match here because, say, negative 1 doesn't match to 0, and then negative 1 is not greater than or equal to 1. So it fails even here. If none of the clauses fail, we get a runtime error. So the process um, which is executing this code terminates. And this, this is a normal approach. You know, avoid defensive programming in, in, in Erlang. And if something which you know, should not happen happens, terminate. Don't try to address it or solve it you know, with, a, with, a, with a catch. Or you know, don't try catching the exception. Because you don't know what to do to clean up after it. Uh, instead, just let the process terminate. Let someone else deal with it. And what we're saying is, with this termination, you're not ignoring the error. You're just dealing with it in a slightly different way than what you might be used to. <clears throat> and I'm going to explain how in a second. Here's another example uh, implementing quick sort using list comprehensions. So list comprehensions were added to the language a little bit later. Uh, this is, uh, I usually you know, blame Phil Wadler for this. Uh, Phil Wadler and Simon Marlow were spending a lot of time at the computer science laboratory when I was there as you know, Simon Marlow was working on his PhD thesis, uh, doing a type system you know, for Erlang. And you know, it, what happened was you know, Phil Wadler convinced Joe Armstrong that any respectable functional uh, programming language must have list comprehensions. And one day, you know, I was walking down the hall, and Joe goes, oh, Francesco, come in, come in, come in. And you know, Joe you know, takes me into this room and shows me his screen. Look, look, look. And he shows me uh, this very example. You know, look at how you, know, you can implement quicksort with four lines of code. And you know, what we do is we take a list here. We break the list into a head. So that's the first element of a list and a tail. We then create a new list where um, we create a new list where we take a, a, an element from the tail, and if it's less than or equal to the head, we, we insert it in a new list and we recurse. You know, we quick sort that list, that sublist. We then create a new list y, where y also comes from the tail, but y is greater than the head. So we basically take a pivot put all the elements larger than a pivot in one list, smaller than the, or equal to the pivot in another list, and then we recurse on, on those, those elements. And, and then yeah, we get the first part of the list, we get the last part, and we do first plus the pivot plus last, and yeah, we've sorted our list. And oh, well, that was great. You know, uh, he also, you know, in conjunction with this, went in and showed me funds, lambdas, which uh, were also not part of the language at the time. And you're know, showing me how you could hide recursive structures and you know, show you know, what was happening on, on particular elements in a little bit of code. You know, and it was beautiful, beautiful. And, and he, goes, he then goes, oh, yeah, he goes to, says two things. Oh, and you, know, you can actually solve the eight queens problems in, in four lines of code. How do you place eight queens on a chessboard without any of the queens um, you know, threatening each other? How many of you have solved the eight queens problem? OK. I didn't. I failed. I spent two nights, um, you know, I spent two nights, sleepless nights, trying to go through the algorithms in my head. I couldn't fall asleep. I, um, I, I, I just couldn't fall asleep. I was trying to figure out, you know, how do we first place all the queens and how, how do we check if it works? And after two sleepless nights, I gave up. Now, this was in 1995. So, Joe, yeah, yeah. Listen, what's the answer to eight queens problem? I failed. I couldn't, I wasn't able to figure it out. I go, and... You know, can, can you just show me the solution? Because I can't go with another night without sleep. And you know, Joe looks at me and goes, oh, I have no idea, but you know, go online and search it somewhere. You know, I've not solved it myself. And you know, that was a time where I love Joe to bits, but that particular morning I could have strangled him. <laughs> now, another thing Joe told me in that office was, oh, oh, use list comprehensions and funds everywhere in your code, but just don't tell anyone about them. 
he goes. And I, I was young, I was naive, I didn't think much about it. But um, about six months later, when I'd started working as a consultant for Ericsson, um, in an airline project, an email comes in on the internal mailing list, which goes, oh, wow, cool, I just found the plus plus operator. Are there any other undocumented features in the language which I should be aware of? And uh, we had a, a, a product owner, airline product owner at the time, which was very, very technical. It took him five minutes to go in and read the compiler code of airline's latest release, and then come out of this with a disclaimer on this internal airline mailing list saying, uh, any undocumented, you know, there is no guarantee that any undocumented features will be included in the next release of airline. Do not use them, thank you. you know, very cold, very blunt. But that created a storm because obviously I wasn't the only one um, who, uh, I wasn't the only one who uh, had been told, use these features everywhere in your code, but don't tell anyone about them. Uh, they were being used in some major projects, including the XD301 switch. And so, yeah, what actually happened at the end yeah, is the next release of airline, yeah, funds and list comprehensions. Uh, and higher order functions were all properly documented and yeah, it became part of the language, officially part of the language. So there, there are different ways you know, to add constructs uh, to the language you know, the day you decide to invent your own and your boss tells you uh, to focus on things you don't want to focus on. So another uh, high level construct is um, pattern matching. Uh, and this is pattern matching on a bit level, so using the bit syntax. How many of you have decoded a TCP packet? A few of you have, yeah. So a TCP packet will consist of a header with 10 mandatory fields and an optional one with data. In this example, you know, we've got uh, a size, a word size of 32 bits. And what we're doing is, you know, we, we've bound the packet to the variable segment. And what we're stating here is we're binding the variable source port to the first 16 bits of the, of the pattern, of the, of, of the packet the destination port to the next 16 bits, the sequence number to 32 bits, to the next 32 bits. So we're basically decoding a whole IP packet. Here we're then using the data um, to calculate the optional size. Options here is an optional, it could be optional. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a field which you might not necessarily have. And, you know, and we look, you know, at the, you know, options is the opt size and it could be, opt size could be zero. So you know, this basically becomes an empty and the rest of the binary is you know, tagged as a binary. We've got some flags here, eight bits, which we go in and extract right here. So the CWR is the first bit, becomes one zero. ECE, the variable ECE is the next bit, and so on. So with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines of code, we've decoded a TCP packet. You know, and I won't ask you what languages you, know, you, you, you did it yourselves in, but yeah unless it was a functional language. Scala. Scala. How many lines of code did you get? Yeah. And once again, it's, you know, it's thanks to the bit syntax. Maintainability was you know, one of the critical items. Uh, concurrency, uh, Erlang has lightweight concurrency. It's, uh, you know, it's got, and very, very early on, they decided to split the concurrency model from the underlying operating system. So from OS threads, they didn't want the limitation of, of it. Um, and you know, it takes less than a micro, sub microseconds to create a new process. You do it using the spawn you know, built-in function, which returns a unique identifier, a PID. And the spawn function will then you know, create this process, which initially in its initial phase just uses a few words of memory, just a few bytes of memory, very, very, very little memory. And then your memory is allocated as and when it's needed. And you know, messages, um, so processes don't share memory. There is no shared memory. Uh, they communicate with each other through message passing. And, you know, and they use it, the message passing is through the the send construct right here, where using the PID, so the unique identifier of the process, we can then send a message to it. The message is received and, and stored in the process's mailbox, and we then use a selective receive to pick out messages we need. So selective receives inc is incredibly important as it allows you to implement complex finite state machines where incoming events you know, can come out of sequence. 
and you then only retrieve you know, the messages which are critical to, you know, to that particular state. Other messages which are kind of sequence remain in the mailbox and only get handled when, when you're in the correct um, place. And very interesting, you, you go in and you ask, um, so wh where, where, where does the idea of you know, lightweight processes come from? Small talk. And uh, you know, in small talk, you've got, ob and you think, hey, small talk, small talk's an object-oriented language. Um, well, small talk has objects. Objects don't share memory, and objects communicate with each other through message passing. And if you ask Alan Kay, you know, that was his definition of OO. And you know, when Joe Armstrong described it, you know, he was not a big kind of fan of Java or C++, even though he's become a bit more diplomatic um, about them in his, um, since you know, uh, retirement. But um, you, know, you, you ask Joe, you know, you know, you know, you go know, in and you ask Joe, you know, how did um, small talk influence Erlang? He goes a lot, and he actually claims, oh, Erlang is the only truly used, you know, OO language the way Alan Kay, you know, meant it. Um, and then you go in and you ask Robert Verding, you know, how did small talk influence um, uh, Erlang? Oh, not at all. He goes, and that shows, you know, how three you know, different people, each with their strengths working together, you know, are able to give you something, you know, as powerful as Erlang. You know, with all of these features. Um, it's robust, so it's got built-in, um, you know, very simple and concise error handling mechanisms. What you do is you link processes to each other, and if a process terminates, um, the termination propagates to other processes. So this, is, this allows you to actually detect failure and react on failure. You know, if you think of idiomatic Java, you've got two threads, a thread fails, how do you find out that something's gone wrong with that thread? In Erlang, you know, Mike Williams went in and invented links. That was his, one of his major contributions. And links allow you to monitor processes. If a process is trapping exits, what happens is that it receives an exit signal from the processes in its links that which have terminated. So the propagation, no, the determination doesn't propagate anymore. And this allows this process right here, which is trapping exits, to then go in and react on that termination. So if a process is terminated, it can go in and decide to restart it. And by restarting it, maybe it terminated because of a corrupt state. By restarting it, you recreate the state and you solve the problem. And this has led way then to what we call OTPM behaviors, where you know, different processes will have different types of behaviors, which are then put into reusable libraries. Uh, the behavior which you know, monitors, starts and monitors other processes is called a supervisor. And then we've got workers, which will include, in the Erlang world, um, they'll include um, uh, uh, gen generic servers, gen servers, finite state machines, event handlers, and, you know, and we're seeing also new, you, know, be, you, know, you can implement your own behaviors, and we're seeing new behaviors also coming in from the Elixir world and Elixir space, which is you know, really, really great. It's, you know, w what's happening, you know, with, with the whole Erlang. I'll, I'll get to Erlang and Alexis and Ghosts in a second. Uh, it's distributed, so, you know, it's got uh, distribute, yeah, d the semantics of a distribution are built into the language. And so if you send a process, a message to a process on the same node, it's exactly the same syntax as sending it on a remote node. Where, you know, in this case, we have the PID, which points to a process on a different machine, on a different node on a different machine. And it's exactly the same code. So with very little change by doing it right from the start, a program which was implemented to run on a single machine can transparently be distributed across a cluster of machines, obviously at the cost of latency, at the cost of sending the message. But you know, you're dealing with soft real-time systems, that cost is, is acceptable. Uh, another really cool thing, you've got hot code loading. You've got the ability to, um, you know, to load and run different versions of the module in, in the code at any one time. And if a process does what we call a fully qualified function call, a check is done to make sure that you're running the latest version of the code, which has been loaded into the VM. And this is on a per module basis. And if you're not, the pointer uh, to the code is moved to the latest version of the code. And it's done retaining the state of the process and retaining all of the variable, all of the variable bindings. So, 
this is needed you know, to achieve the five nines availability we're talking about, which includes a software upgrade, which include upgrades and support. And yep, uh, the biggest you know, multi-core um, multi support was more by accident. They weren't thinking of multi-core when they invented Erlang. But the biggest you know, issue to scaling on multi-core is based on Amdahl's law, it's based on you know, the sequential code. And what Amdahl's law tells you is that you know, your, 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 uh, your program will be as fast as its sequential code. Erlang's a concurrent language. You've got processes which run you know, concurrently. And the fact, you know, the, the biggest, uh, and the second, you know, the biggest issue you know, to scaling a multi-core is memory lock contention. It's locks, and well, Erlang processes don't share memory. They communicate with message passing. And so by doing that, you know, by default, they had something which scales on multi-core architectures. And I think that's where a lot of the effort is going on today, increasing you know, the scaling on, on multi-core architectures and trying to make the whole VM completely lock-free. And I think Kosti Sagonas, who was supposed to be here, um, but unfortunately had visa problems, you know, is one of those leading the way when it comes to this research. And, you know, I'm I'm, and, and then we've got OTP, which, which I mentioned briefly. And I think there'll be other talks here during the day on OTP, so I'll jump over it. But I just wanted to wrap up with a few myths of Erlang. So I've been talking about all of the great things, but there are a few myths out there which you need to be dispelled. And the first is that of the hero programmer. Uh, at least, you know, in the very, very early days, we had a lot of people saying, hey, I wrote my system in four weeks. And then, you know, they were going at conferences presenting about them. And, yeah, well, uh, we, yeah, many of the projects we work on, just the documentation takes, you know, ten times longer. <laughs> uh, you know, you know, first question, you know, is, is your four-week program documented? Are you the one being uh, woken up in the middle of the night when your customers actually tell you that your system's not working? Um, what visibility do you know, those who actually are supposed to do maintenance have in what's going on? And you know, how much code was actually written? Uh, you know, beware of the hero programmer. Yeah, they're great, but they need to be part of a larger team and, yeah, and be taught to cooperate a bit more. Upgrades during runtime are easy. I'm, I had a nice little animation on my PowerPoint where I showed a pointer pointing you know, from one module, switching it to another, and hey, all your variables are, 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 are retained. They're not easy. Uh, software upgrades, when you're dealing with a complex telecom system consisting of two million lines of code with non-backward compatible protocols, uh, where in which you know, you've got millions of calls you know, being routed you know, every, every hour, is not for the faint of heart. Um, it is incredibly easy and incredibly powerful for you know, simple patches, and you need to, you know, you know, and it's incredibly easy when you're adding functionality with that without actually changing the state. Um, you know, your problems happen, you know, with non-backward compatible changes, uh, database schema changes. It, it is done, it's being done all the time, but, you know, you need to be aware of it. Uh, state changes in your process, upgrades in distributed systems, and the only key is to test, 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 and test. And they do it with really complex systems, but you need and need to test it. And I think, you know, most of the failures, you know, I, I talk about, you know, uh, well, nine nines availability, most of the failures actually um, happen during upgrades because there's some edge or borderline case which was actually missed. Uh, another myth is, hey, we achieved nine nines availability. You know, that's three milliseconds of downtime per year. I don't know how you manage to write a system with three milliseconds of downtime per year. And the problem is, you know, what happened was the British Telecom went out with a press release stating that, you know, during a trial period of, you know, the world's largest voice over the M backbone, which was developed, uh, which they went live with in 2002, um, we achieved nine nines availability. And that was over a six month period where there was a minor blip and a minor, minor outage. Um, that press release actually resulted in a, a quote, which is my favorite. As a matter of fact, the network performance has been so reliable, there is almost a risk that our field engineers do not learn maintenance skills. And uh, with the kind of answer sheet in our hands a few years later, we know it's, it, it, there's not almost a risk, there is a risk. You, you've got these systems which never fail, and then all of a sudden something goes wrong. There's no small firefighting because a process will crash, it will terminate. 
it self-heals because it will be restarted. And the only blip is that maybe a call is dropped and all the other existing calls go through. The, the, the maintenance engineers don't even notice or realize you know, that blip has happened. Um, and so, you know, outages have happened, outages do happen. And you know, five nines availability is much more like it. Nine nines availability is a fantasy, which, uh, yeah, which, um, which, which is unfortunate. Everyone was going out talking about these, these nine nines. You know, five nines, which is a few minutes of downtime per year, is much more like it. And it doesn't come free of charge. You know, you need to do a lot of it. You need to think of it in your design. You need, you know, no single points of failure. Uh, you need retry strategies. You know, it, there, there's a lot which goes into achieving these five nines. But, you know, believe me, you, you'll do it. If you're using a functional programming language, you can achieve it at a fraction of the cost of your, your conventional technologies. And, you know, I was talking about this, um, yeah, I, and I want to talk about a fraction of the cost. I was talking about the study at Harriet Watt where they went in and counted what every single line of C++ code did and every single line of airline code did. And you know, the defensive programming and the error handling in the C++ code consisted of about 25% of the code base. On the airline side, it was 1%. So just by, by using existing libraries such as supervisors, you're, yeah, and not going in and doing defensive programming, they removed 25% of the code base. And, and, and that's what I mean, you know, you can do it at a fraction of the effort. There's a lot happening in, in uh, the Erlang world. So, uh, you know, Elixir is one of the things, one of the, you know, great languages which is coming out of the Erlang ecosystem. It's, you know, really great to see, you know, different tool set, a different approach to developing software, which, you know, the Erlang world is not used to. Um, you know, we, we, we all have, you know, different approaches, you know, based on the types of problems we're solving. And, but, you know, building on the success of Erlang, you know, I was really excited to actually see this blog post where they managed to reach, you know, 2 million, um, you know, WebSocket connections on Phoenix on a vanilla Erlang VM and a vanilla operating system. So, you know, without doing any changes to the VM or to the operating system. And this happened, I believe, this was last year. This happened sometime last year. You know, in the Erlang world, you know, WhatsApp had, been, had managed to achieve the same in 2012. They, you know, they reached 1 million TCP IP connections on a single VM on a single machine in 2011. And then January 2012, you know, happy 2012, they go in and announce that, you know, they had gone in and managed to achieve, you know, 2 million TCP IP connections. And that was by doing changes in FreeBSD in the operating system as well as in the VM itself. And, you know, the goal, you know, what they were trying to do was, you know, what they were trying to do was actually minimize the amount of servers on which they could run their service. They knew that their service was going to be free or very, very cheap. They really wanted to reduce the support costs, the maintenance costs, and the overhead costs. So, you know, that's what their focus was. And, you know, all of the hard work they've done now has filtered back in, into, into Elixir as well, and, and the application's being developed with Linux. Perfect, yeah. So lots of great books to read and you know, lots of online resources. And I think um, you know, if you do have any questions, I'm around for the next two days. You know, feel, please feel free to come in and ask. And I really, really hope you're, you're going to enjoy you know, the, the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.